Okay, so uh, before, uh, so we will talk about the semantics of propositional logic. Uh, as I said, you know, the initial idea is to be as boring as possible so that we fix all the notation in a certain way, uh, in a certain way peculiar to me, peculiar to logic, peculiar to distinguishing between various things which are normally not distinguished in various books easily. Uh, so they create some kind of problem. So we will go about it slowly and uh, we will start coming up with logical concepts uh, from propositional logic which can be applied to first order logic later. So one of the first things in any language that you have to do is to define its semantics, the meaning of the constructs of the language. And uh, so before, we, before I get on to the actual semantics of propositional logic, uh, let me just briefly go to the previous lecture and uh, uh, and recap some of the things there. Uh, so we have this boolean. Okay, so I have a color coding. Huh? Brown is because it's down to earth, and that's what things are supposed to mean. Um, and of course, uh, and. Uh, we are talking about a logic, uh, a language. When we are talking about a logic, you are talking about a language. And uh, the sentences of this language, we are talking about a formal language whose sentences are essentially trees, like abstract syntax trees. And so there is a color coding of green for essentially objects belonging to this object language. So here in our case, the object language is propositional logic. And when we talk about it, of course, we talk about it in a mixture of mathematics and English. And that is the meta language of the description. So there are already two different languages. So there is an object language, which is the target language of our discussion. And in order to talk about the tar target language, we need a meta language and that meta language uh, since it is mathematical logic, it is English with uh, concepts of uh, from mathematics. Since uh, we are going to treat logic as a subdiscipline of mathematics, so it essentially is a mixture of that. So our meta language is always going to be in, essentially in black color, right? So right now we have two colors, uh, uh, and uh, even your the brown color for the semantics is just a distinguishing color. It's not a separate language. So we have, we will keep worrying about the fact that when we are talking about various relations, whether they belong to the object language or do they belong to the meta language. So unless I made serious mistakes, the object language will always be green. So the relations in the object language will be green and the relations in the meta language will be either black or some other color depending on in the case of for example in the case of equality on boolean algebra that is it's that is a brown color right by because it's a relation on that algebra so i have made that algebra brown in color so so we have to and we will we will already come across various kinds of equalities subtle differences which uh, which we need to distinguish yeah okay so this is the this is our language syntax and in the grand old tradition of programming languages, we express it in some uh, form, in some form which is called similar to the, which is a sort of glorified Bacchus Nord form. Okay, I have added two symbols. These are called bottom and top. Of course, one of the things is, one of the nice things that uh, mathematicians like to do is to create one-to-one -one correspondences. Uh, since our um, mod, uh, or language of the model, namely Boolean algebra, has these two elements 0 and 1, it's a good idea to give them also a linguistic representation. So essentially this bottom will refer to absolute falsehood, not relative. As I said, truth is can be relative and uh, falsehood can also be relative. So this bottom will represent essentially, is essentially the link in the object language, it is a representation of uh, absolute falsehood and top refers to absolute truth. Okay. Uh, anyway, that will become clear when we give, define the semantics. Uh, right. So, so this is our language. 
P uh, is a general uh, is a general symbol. P Q R small P Q R are things we'll use for propositions, atomic propositions, and for compound propositions we'll use these Greek letters like phi, psi, chi, and theta, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, uh, and of course, all of them will be uh, the, the objects. The sentences of the object language will be in green in color. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that is the thing. So, uh, so this uh, we are when we are talking about arities of operators. So the addition of this bottom and top is essentially as constants in the algebra, right? Uh, so, so they have an arity of zero. Uh, so it is. It is not. Uh, uh, there is no reason to talk about uh, its precedence. Yeah. So bottom and top are constants and have, and they have no precedence associated with them. Or you can think of them as having a higher precedence than even negation. Zero area operators. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So as I said, uh, our. our the most important thing is we will be looking at these sentences essentially as abstract syntax trees because parentheses with precedence and so on things can look syntactically different. So we will essentially say that any two propositions phi and psi which have the same abstract syntax tree will be considered syntactically identical. And so when I say that I also mean that for example this is not is not syntactically identical with something like this is not syntactically identical with this yeah um, let's let's make it clear that anything like the commutative law and so on and so forth is a derived law before we have defined the semantics these two trees are different Okay, so these two are not syntactically identical, right? Yet, so we, we cannot presume the existence of commutativity or associativity of any operators till we have defined this. So these two are not syntactically identical, and um, we will use this triple segment to denote syntactic identity. Notice that it's black in color. So we are talking about comparison of two objects in our meta language so that so so whatever is green is in the object language this syntactic identity is a relation we are talking about the objects so it is in our meta language therefore it's black yeah or it's at least not green right so this is this is something that is going to be important especially if we reach if we reach a stage in this course where we start talking about Gödel's incompleteness and so on and so forth, then it will become important to distinguish what exactly belongs to the object language and what belongs to the meta language. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So then, formally, uh, as I said, we'll take a completely algebraic viewpoint, and a completely algebraic viewpoint is essentially this. So we talk about a truth assignment. A truth assignment is just a tau, it's just a function tau which assigns to every atom a truth value from that brown set 0, 1. Yeah. So, so basically there is a the truth assignment just tells us uh, for each atomic proposition whether it in under that truth assignment whether it is true or false. Yeah. Okay, the truth value of a proposition phi is uh, defined by induction on the structure of propositions by a function which I am calling t and uh, and that t actually depends on that truth assignment tau. So I am putting the subscript tau and this this peculiar double brackets that you see is often in, in, print, uh, in printed books is often a standard way of separating out syntax of the object language, syntactical elements of the object language from the meta language. But we will continue to use this because if you if you are going to, if you print these things out in black and white then you need some distinction. Uh, at least here we have color but otherwise normally 
this is these are in the community of uh, uh, programming language theorists this is often called semantic brackets but actually they enclose syntax yeah um, so the other thing is that they are actually defining this function t okay so we have actually a new kind of equality a new kind of equality in the meta language which is definitional equality so there are there are things which are equal by definition and that's what we will use so we have to so at a certain level uh, it may not matter whether a function uh, whether a, a certain statement is equal to another statement uh, whether a certain expression is equal to another expression by either by definition or by derivation but at least and in the initial stages we have to be able to distinguish between all of them so we will use this to essentially defi define uh, the function yeah so so here is the definition so now what we are saying is bottom uh, the the meaning of bottom or here in our case uh, in most programming languages we talk about the meaning of the language usually as if it's an imperative language a change of state if it's a functional language of the value of an expression in the case of logic the notion of meaning is restricted to whether it's true or false right so that's the notion of meaning and so this this function t essentially um, uh, assigns regardless of what tau might be it actually gives a value of, it defines this bottom as absolute falsehood and it defines top as absolute truth uh, and uh, for any propositional atom p of course you have uh, whatever is assigned by the by the function tau is the truth value of that prop atomic proposition and then by induction given the truth values of propositions of smaller depths a proposition of a depth not phi is defined as the bar this bar is brown color i hope you can make out the brown color yeah uh, it's the inverse whatever is the truth value of phi in the truth assignment tau uh, and similarly in the case of and it's just the product operation uh, and in the case of or it's the sum operation in the case of the conditional it is the less than or equal to dot operation remember that less than or equal to dot is an operation right which we defined and in the case of the biconditional it is essentially the equal to dot operation so this is how we will formally specify and this is this is a style of specification which is also fairly popular uh, in uh, programming languages though uh, it's quite possible that uh, you did not uh, do it in this style uh, but um, if you were do if you were to do a course on the semantics of programming languages in which denotational semantics is used uh, then you will actually find this style of definition so basically what you are saying is syntax is used in order to represent some semantics so so there so semantics is always a function uh, and uh, which given certain semantical notions you want representation so your object language tries to represent them right and so that is uh, so your uh, so so your semantics hangs on the structure of your syntax so in a certain sense the semantics is by and it's uh, it's in it's by structural induction because essentially what you're saying is if i were to if, if i have to evaluate a uh, a compound proposition like this yeah then essentially i'm doing an induction based on the structure of the subtrees yeah so 
the meaning of so the meaning of this this portion so the meaning of this whole proposition is dependent on the individual meanings of these two subtrees yeah and the meaning of the individual subtrees by induction is dependent on the subtrees under them the meanings of the subtrees under them and that is that's how structural induction works and uh, structural induction, of course, uh, uh, by now uh, you must have studied structural induction in programming languages. And you, will, you, you must also remember that structural induction is actually exactly equivalent to the principle of mathematical induction. I hope that is clear to everybody. Structural induction is, has the same power as the principle of mathematical induction. So almost, so any proof by structural induction can also be rewritten as a proof by the principle of mathematical induction and vice versa. So, as, but what structural induction gives you just is a sort of convenient case analysis. Yeah, that's, that's what. So, it's principle of mathematical induction where in the induction hypothesis you have a number of cases. Right? That's, uh, that's really what structural induction is. So, so there is absolutely no uh, difference in power between the principle of mathematical induction and the structural induction. Right. So, as in the case of mathematical induction, you can have definitions by induction and you can have proofs by induction. So, in the case of structural induction too, you can have definitions by structural induction and proofs by structural induction. And this is a case of a definition by structural induction. So, given any syntax, uh, the best way to cover all the syntactical elements in the language that is generated by the syntax is to define it by structural induction is to define the syntax by semantics by structural induction, right? And that will cover all of it. Uh, okay, right. So now, so this is as far as the pure uh, algebraic aspects of the theory are concerned. And now we have to come and this is all like more or less like normal mathematics or whatever. Uh, what is it that distinguishes logic as a subdiscipline of mathematics or some other logical concepts? which we will begin to look at, okay? So, so the, the basic fundamentals have been set. You have an object language and you have a semantics given in a known structure, namely the, namely Boolean algebra, yeah? Okay. So, a proposition is said to be a tautology or logically valid. Okay, I mean, at, at this point, at the level of propositional logic, there is no difference between the two terms tautology and logically valid. But when we go into first order logic, I'm going to distinguish between the two. Yeah. If it is true under all truth assignments, yeah, and it's a contradiction, or it's also called unsatisfiable, if it is false under all truth assignments, right? Otherwise, if it is neither a tautology nor a contradiction, it is said to be a contingent statement. Yeah. Nobody will define. The whole point about mathematics is that it's platonic. And what does platonic mean? It means that they exist. There exist an uncountable number of truth assignments, tau. Right? You agree with that because you are taking the set of all possible total functions from the set of atoms A to the Boolean set 0, 1. And that there are an uncountable number of truth assignments and they exist. That's it. There is nothing algorithmic about it. There is nothing constructive about it. The fact that they exist itself is, is all that you require. And that is the platonic ideal. Yeah? Okay. So, so it, uh, a proposition is said to be uh, logically valid. And we will look at logical validity uh, more importantly. Uh, in, the case of in the case of propositional logic, it's just the same as a being a tautology. If it is true under all truth assignments, and it's uh, contingent, and it's a contradiction, or it is said to be unsatisfiable, 
if it is false under all truth assignments and it is uh, contingent if it is neither a tautology nor a contradiction. Uh, so which means that there are certain truth assignments tau in which the proposition might be true and some other truth, truth assignments tau prime in which the proposition might be false, yeah, uh, which comes from the structural inductive definition. Um, so uh, a formula is satisfiable if it is not a contradiction, which means it could be a tautology or it could be contingent. But what, what this says is that it is not the case that it is false under all truth assignments, which means that there exists at least one truth assignment in which this formula is true. Okay. So herein you are looking at these kinds of uh, statements when I say which means and so on and so forth, I am already actually using uh, principles of reasoning which are common in mathematics but which are actually codified in first order logic. When I say something like if it is not a contradiction then what you are saying is that it is not false under all truth assignments which means that there exists a truth assignment in which it is true and all this is actually like first order reason, right. But it's all it's, it's also standard mathematical reasoning and so the this this kind of uh, this kind of definition uh, uh, consequence uh, mechanism is what codifies first order logic and we will use that quite frequently right okay a formula is fa falsifiable if it is not a tautology which means there exists at least one truth assignment out of that uncountable number of truth assignments in which the formula can be shown to be false, right, okay. Certain other standard things like um, which uh, we will, so we will also look at uh, for example, uh, so, uh, we will look at uh, the notions, certain other notions which are important from a purely logical point of view is one is that we will actually uh, think of uh, we will say for any tau for any truth assignment tau if you have a formula phi Okay, this indicates that phi is true under tau. Okay, so uh, phi uh, phi is true under tau. That means uh, we are essentially saying that if you look at this. this is equal to 1. Yeah. So, uh, certain, so this is, so uh, in the, in the area of algorithms of course there is uh, a standard thing about proving satisfiability, right. I mean I don't know whether you heard about it. Uh, one of the things that you want to uh, uh, a problem is, so, 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 so the problem of 3 sat is NP complete, okay. What is the 3 sat problem? Basically there is, okay, so our problem sat is N, NP complete, which essentially means given a Boolean formula, which is essentially a propositional logic formula. Finding whether it has a satisfying assignment, okay, whether there exists a tau 
for which the formula is true, that problem is essentially NP complete. Right? Notice that what we what we also have is that if you have any any formula phi, I can also think about by structural induction, I can define uh, I can define atoms of phi, right? When I define atoms of phi, I can define this by structural induction. Basically, if phi is just an atom, uh, if it is true or uh, if it is bottom or top, then of course the atoms of phi are empty, let us say. Um, for convenience, some people include bottom and top also as an atom, but let us keep them separate. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if, if phi is just an uh, atomic proposition, then of course that itself is the atom of phi. There's a set, so it's a singleton set. Uh, for for any formula like uh, phi and psi, you look at all the atoms of phi and all the atoms of psi, and you take the union of the the two sets, and you get the set of all atoms of phi and psi. And by structural induction, that's what happens with the other binary operators. And in the case of not phi, it's just the atoms of phi. Yeah. Okay. So we can define this. So it's clear that if I take two truth assignments, tau and tau prime, which for the atoms of phi have exactly the same assignment, and they differ only for those atoms which do not occur in phi, then clearly uh, tau tau prime satisfies phi if and only if tau satisfies phi, right? Okay, so, so, so herein lies uh, the fundamental uh, thing about the truth table. So, the, the atoms of phi is anyway a finite set, the atoms of phi is a finite set. So, it allows us to uh, define uh, so it allows us to define truth tables which are essentially of size um, 2 raised to the cardinality of the size of phi, right. But basically what you are saying is under this condition uh, it is it is possible to collapse from the point of view of phi it is possible to collapse all the truth assignments the uncountable set of truth assign possible truth assignments to sets of to essentially a finite number of classes such that tau and tau prime are the same, are belong to the same class, right? Right? So, which means that the problem becomes finitary. It is only necessary, it is not ne necessary to know the whole of a truth value, a truth assignment tau. It is only necessary to know the assignment of tau for the particular atoms in phi, that is it. And that is where we construct, that is how we construct truth tables. So, we construct truth tables only based on the truth values assigned to the atoms of phi, right. And that, those are finite always, which essentially what we are saying therefore is that now, so now the problem of computing uh, of satisfiability works out to essentially saying, can you find a satisfactory assignment of truth values only to the atoms of phi? And then I do not care about all other atoms and that is a finite set. So, which means that that is something that is algorithmically, uh, firstly if it is infinite it is not algorithmically possible at all, but now it actually becomes something. Is it possible algorithmically? That is a question that becomes feasible and uh, algorithmically it is possible because we can construct truth tables. What is this? What is the size of a truth table typically? You have it is it is uh, essentially exponential in the size of 
the formula. When we say the size of the formula, we are including the num not only the number of atoms, but also all the, op the number of operators, occurrences of operators in the formula, right. So, it is essentially that. So, the, 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 the truth table will have uh, order of the number of atoms columns, uh, uh, rows, uh, no, it will have actually, uh, it will have, no, two raised to the number of atoms rows and as many columns as the length of the uh, formula basically, right. For each operator, I will require a new column, that is. So, the truth table will have a size that 2 raised to the number of atoms multiplied by the number size of the form. So, in terms of possibility therefore, there is an algorithmic possibility, but then this algorithmic possibility is exponential in the size of the formula, right. And normally like good data structures and algorithms people, we would like to find non-exponential algorithms because if because formula sizes can become really large. In such a case, finding non-exponential sizes of uh, non-exponential time algorithms becomes a challenge. But what we will see in most of this course is that practically anything interesting that you want to do algorithmically is going to be exponential in size. So, which means we do calculate, we will calculate complexity in our algorithms, but they will except for the most trivial problems, all the problems will be exponential, at least will be at least exponential. Some of them will be doubly exponential, some of them will be tri even more. So, you, you they will go as exponential towers, you know, you have seen the exponential tower, I mean, 2 raised to 2 raised to 2 raised to 2 and so you will, they, so the, the most efficient ones will probably just be exponential. So, in a certain sense, this is where I first, I want to make the first statement uh, regarding uh, how we cannot therefore, just dismiss of anything just because it is exponential, okay. yeah. Because if you are going to do theorem proving, you have to live with it. The only alternative therefore, is to come up with heuristic methods for reducing the size somehow. You will, you will never get down, you will never be able to get it down to less than exponential anyway. But you might want, you might require, you might have good efficient data structuring mechanisms by which uh, at least the space also is not exponential. Maybe it will remain in p space, you know, uh, time might still be exponential. But then what you are saying is that exponential, when you look at the analysis of algorithms, uh, when you say something is exponential, basically what you are saying is it is in the asymptotic case, right, for large values of the input. So, many of our algorithms might actually be uh, dependent on the size of this, on the size of this object, atoms of phi or length of phi, right. In which case, they, if they are all, ex, if they are exponential, uh, it does not matter. What we want to do therefore, is to somehow prune maybe the space or you want to factor out computations, so that you do not do duplicate computations for the same thing uh, and thereby speed up. And since this exponential are only in the asymptotic case, for, uh, for sizes less than that threshold, uh, things are still possible on a, on a standard machine and therefore, we should be able to, we should be, we should be designing algorithms for our currently available technology. So, we do not dismiss of algorithms just because they are exponential. Basically, we live with the idea that all interesting problems have only exponential algorithms. But in practice, it is possible to still get results for a large subset of the problems that we are interested in, right. That is 
So that is important here. Yeah? So, so as you can see truth table construction itself is exponential right. So one of the first problems on NP completeness uh, defined by Steve Cook was to was to show that there is no polynomial way of essentially finding a satisfying truth assignment to a Boolean formula that means to a propositional logic formula right and the other important thing that he showed in NP completeness was that every problem which is inherently exponential can be reduced to the Boolean satisfiability problem. Okay. So, they, the NP completeness forms is a class of problems such that I, this reduction process and there is a polynomial time reduction of all the NP complete problems to each other basically. So, you take some representation of the problem, I can, I can show that there is in a polynomial time I can reduce it to a satisfiable Boolean satisfiability problem. So, Boolean satisfiability is basically because everything is you are assuming finite domains, finite sets, finite, fin everything is finite right for it to be algorithmically possible right. So, first thing most of our algorithms are going to be exponential. Our question is do we get, do you have some nice ideas to make it, make them feasible and run in reasonable amount of time and that is the challenge for theorem proving. Is there is of course a more complicated subject of heuristic analysis and so on and so forth, but we will not get into that because we are primarily interested in logical problems. Logical problems from the point of view of theorem proving, from the point of view of satisfiability, unsatisfiability is another thing, yeah. And uh, we are also interested in the logical concepts, 